Okay, Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Yes, I'm ready for the event. Guinness World Records, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Claire McClanahan with Guinness World Records. How do you hear me? I have you loud and clear, Claire. How do you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, Dr. Whitson, I must start by saying that on behalf of Guinness World Records and of course my three-year-old daughter who really wants to go to space someday, I am so grateful that you're spending some time with us today. Well, you make sure to tell her she can become an astronaut if she wants to. Just takes a lot of work. I will absolutely convey that message. Okay, so you've been up there for over 534 days. So what are you doing up there? Well, we've been uh, doing a lot of interesting research. I am, have been very excited on this expedition with the uh, amounts of research that we've done. We've also gotten to do uh, a few spacewalks. I've done four so far, and uh, um, we do the routine maintenance to keep the station up and running. It's a huge vehicle and uh, it's been up here for 17 years and we're trying to develop new systems and so things have to be worked on and maintained and upgraded uh, all the time. So it's a pretty busy time. I haven't felt bored in, since I got here in, in November last year. That is remarkable. Now, I saw an earlier interview in which you talked about one mission of, or one objective of this mission is to explore how extended time and space affects the body and mind. What have you learned not only about that, but about yourself in being in space for this long? Well, I think uh, if you have the right attitude, you can stay in space for a long period of time and it's actually very satisfying and enjoying. Um, I think that from a research perspective, we're learning lots of things, although the data analysis won't obviously be complete until I return and, and in many cases, uh, more subjects have to return and we gather all the data together to, to make a big picture that fits uh, not just an individual, but a profile of people so that we understand how the human body is specifically affected here in microgravity. That's so fascinating to, to me and I'm sure all of our viewers. So I do actually want to go back to the beginning a little bit. I've read that you've been interested in being an astronaut as early as the fourth grade. Were there any teachers or scientists who particularly inspired you as a child? Well, actually, in the when I was nine, I saw the first astronauts walk on the moon. So I thought, wow, cool job. But I think when you're nine, you want to be lots of, of things. And it wasn't until I graduated from high school and they selected the first female astronauts that year. And I think it went from being a dream to becoming a goal of mine to try and become an astronaut. Uh, of course, throughout the years, I've had the pleasure, the privilege, the luxury of having wonderful mentors and leaders along the way that have shown me that it is possible to become an astronaut. Uh, and actually that it's possible to be uh, a female and a scientist. I, I was lucky enough to have many advisors starting in uh, college and then in graduate school who happened to be female. Dr. Graff and Dr. Matthews really helped me along and you know I was inspired by their, their energy, their motivation, their drive um, made me feel that I could also do things that I wanted to do. That's great. I do remember seeing that Sally Ride as the first American woman in space is what really solidified for you the possibility of having this career. What do you, now you are a role model, so what do you hope to inspire in people who are following in your footsteps? Well, I, I hope to inspire folks to, to dream big, to go after your dreams, even if they might seem impossible because you never know. I, I think the one piece of advice that I think is probably most important is 
uh, to try and do something more than you might think you are capable of because you will surprise yourself. That's such a powerful message. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we saw, um, obviously, you are floating in space right in front of us, and we saw your microphone twirl. Uh, what does that feel like? Is the anti-gravity still fun, or is it just another day at the office? Actually, it's still amazing to be able to float and move around and pretty much effortlessly do whatever you want with your body. Uh, in space is pretty amazing. It does have some disadvantages though because in some cases when you're working with small items or articles it's easy to lose them and so you have to keep track of all the things that you're working on and that that uh, you know requires some extra planning uh, make sure you have velcro or tape sticky side up so that you can put things down while you're working on on experiments or fixing hardware etc. Well, I have no doubt that people who are watching are, I'm sure there are many who are inspired to um, try to get into the space program. Is the training as hard as it seems? Actually, I found it extremely challenging, um, but we've got lots of really smart folks that probably didn't, wouldn't say the same about it. Uh, but a lot of hard work and dedicated effort uh, really paid off for me. And so I feel like that it can pay off for other folks as well. Probably the hardest thing that I had to learn, you know, I, going in as a biochemist, uh, maybe orbital mechanics was probably challenging, but it, the reality was the, the very hardest thing was uh, learning the Russian language. Um, so every, everybody's got their strengths and weaknesses and that one was mine. Uh, I have to ask, are you fluent in Russian now? Was that a requirement that you had to achieve? Um, I, I would say I'm Soyuz fluent. I flew in the left seat of the Soyuz, so I can talk a lot about pumps and pressures and temperatures and things like that, very mechanical things, but talking to someone in a conversation, my vocabulary is not very deep, so it just depends on the subject. But I, I uh, on my last flight, I was in the left seat in the Soyuz, so I had to be uh, pretty fluent in order to get by that in that position because all the procedures are in Russian, all the displays are in Russian, and so it required that. Well, Peggy, you, you definitely impressed me for what it's worth. Um, so we really want to know what is a typical day like for you on the International Space Station? Well, we get up in the morning, uh, we get up on GMT time because we have control centers all around the world. So we're on Greenwich Mean Time and so we get up at 6 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And we talk to control centers all around the world. So we have Houston and Huntsville in the United States. We've got Munich in uh, Germany and then we've got uh, uh, Tsukuba in Japan and uh, of course Moscow in Russia as well. And so all those uh, countries have control centers and we do in scientific investigations for all different you know all the different countries that are participating uh, as a part of this huge international project so any one day could be made up of any of those types of experiments it could be uh, robotics operations uh, for capturing a vehicle it could be uh, practicing just maintaining skills, skills that we hope we never have to use like, you know, some of the medical training or some of our emergency training. We want to make sure that we stay, you know, ready to react in those, in case of those emergencies. Um, but, uh, and occasionally we get to do spacewalks and as I said, you know, my favorite love right now is all the fabulous research that we're doing. Is there a kind of research that you get particularly excited about when you know you're about to embark on a mission? Well, interestingly, a lot of times uh, the investigations we don't have a lot of details on before we launch. We are trained generically to do lots of different things. 
And then when the investigations get manifest and put on board, that's when we know the finalized plans. And so it's only a few months before the mission that we might have a, a more definitive plan of what those investigations are. I would say some of my favorite ones on this mission have involved cell cultures. We're growing uh, bone tissue culture cells, stem cells, and uh, the most recent one we were growing is a lung cancer cells, which we were uh, adding a drug that uh, it was conjugated to an antibody that recognized that specific lung cancer cells to see if that would be more effective in uh, treating and you know trying to reduce as a, uh, a targeted chemotherapy type of system for the future. Is there something unique about doing that kind of research? I mean, obviously there's something unique about doing that kind of research in space. Can you, and it's a large topic, I'm sure, can you speak to that a little bit about how doing cancer research in space um, impacts some of the ultimate results? Well, it's not just the cancer research. A lot of the physical properties, we're looking at combustion in space, we're looking at protein crystallizations and other types of crystallizations. And those things happen differently in a zero gravity environment. And they can teach us lessons about how things work on the ground. We can either modify procedures to improve them on the ground, or we can use things directly from space, like protein crystals. We can analyze them on the ground because they're better, they're uh, more perfect in their structural form and can be easier to uh, determine their molecular structure on the ground. So there's lots of ways we use the lack of gravity uh, as our our tool. That That's what this laboratory up here at 17,500 miles an hour is giving us, um, is research without gravity. And it's a whole new variable that changes how a lot of things work. And it makes us better understand some how things work on the ground. And so it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for scientists out there. Science, as you know, science and technology moves at an ever increasing rate. What would you say are the biggest differences from your first mission to today, both in the technology, uh, but also the types of research that you do? Well, definitely, I think the complexity of the research we're doing now is much higher level. And in part, that had to do with when I first flew in space, we were still pretty much assembling the space station. So the majority of our time was spent on that. Uh, we, I did do research. I grew super, superconductor crystals and soybeans on my first flight. So I had quite a diverse uh, science plan then, but not nearly the degree and level that we're conducting research now. So that's been exciting for me this time around. I think it's so interesting that you you all have to plan so much for almost anything to happen. So I, there must be a part of you that has to keep this very relaxed, open mind. Do you have any routines that are good luck routines before you go on a mission that help to ground you? You know, I don't really have any good luck routines. It's really interesting. Uh, my first flight, I launched and landed on a shuttle, uh, and then my second flight on the Soyuz. And so it's interesting to see the different traditions that, that develop in the different countries and what's important to people. Um, for me, you know, I just am focused on the mission and thinking about the flight and always worried about trying not to screw up. So that's the, the big thing uh, that's always on my mind prior to flight. Once you get here, I think you relax a little bit more and it's everything is, uh, you know, day to day, comes a little more routine. That, that actually brings me to a question that we were discussing this morning. There are so many movies now about space travel and fictionalized ways that space travel is. Do you ever watch those movies and what are your, do you, do they get into your head, those kinds of movies? And have you ever had sort of a movie moment while on a mission? Actually, we have movie night every, every, pretty much every Friday night. We were watching, uh, movies with, as a crew here on board now. Uh, and many times they are space movies because it's a common theme for all of us. And so, 
but in terms of a movie moment, no, I don't, I don't know that I have any movie moments, but uh, it, it is an amazing experiment experience up here. Um, and I wish that movies could convey how special it is. Um, so we have a, a question from one of our viewers. Um, obviously, a lot of people get very interested in sort of the day-to-day -day of what it's like to be in the International Space Station. Paul wanted to know, what do you do if you get something like a toothache or a cold? Like, what, do you, what do you do in that situation when you're in outer space? Well, we're trained as crew medical officers, and we always have the ground to help us out. So, you know, for minor things, uh, even pretty minor things, we would probably still reference the ground team to help us uh, uh, guide us through which procedures they wanted us to conduct. But we do receive some training on the ground prior uh, to being in space. It's uh, like EMT, like training, uh, getting exposure to different things that might be relevant to things we might have happen here on orbit. Uh, in terms of illness, because we live in a pretty isolated environment up here, we don't really get sick for the most part. Um, and we actually quarantine our crews before launch for uh, one to two weeks in order to try and prevent uh, bringing up uh, colds or cold germs or other, other things like the flu or other uh, illnesses. So. And it seems to work pretty well. None of us have been sick. Well, I'm so glad. I, if I uh, ever need to be ultimately healthy, I know I'll just need to go to space. <laughs> um, so let's talk about Guinness World Records a little bit. So you have three titles, most spacewalks by a woman, most accumulated time on spacewalks by a female, and oldest astronaut female. Did it, what did it feel like to get these record titles and do they stay top of mind for you or is it something that doesn't, you're, you're probably more focused on the mission, but I would love to hear your thoughts on, on your position in Guinness World Records. Well, I think, you know, I, I feel like the reason that I'm here is to do my job and I'm going to do it to the best of my abilities and uh, the records, I think, are important to, uh, for NASA to demonstrate what we're doing, how we're expanding, and what we're improving on. And that continual improvement, that continual expansion of our records uh, is an important one uh, for all of us at NASA, not just me. Is there anything that you haven't achieved yet, and not specific to Guinness World Records, but just in the spirit of talking about achievement and expansion and discovery, is there something you have in mind that you would love to discover um, as you continue space travel? Well, I would love to set foot on a, another pl planet, lunar or, or Mars or somewhere, but I'm afraid that I might be getting a tad bit old for that, so, <laughs> unfortunately. So, anyway, I, I'm uh, hoping that uh, the future will provide folks like your daughter an opportunity to live, maybe, and work on Mars and uh, explore space even beyond. I can't think of a better way to end this incredible opportunity. Peggy, it, it has been so lovely to speak with you. Thank you very, very much for spending time with us today. Um, good luck up there and have a safe trip home when you return. All right. Thank you very much. And it was great talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you, all participants with Guinness World Records. We are now resuming operational audio communications.